One Young World delegates to this session. My name is Anna Mosiashvili. Uh, I'm One Young World Coordinating Ambassador for Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And it's my pleasure <laughs> to uh, moderate today's discussion on driving impact the future of female leadership. And I'm thrilled to be joined by Iftihaj Muhammad, US Olympic medalist fencer, New York Times best-selling author and entrepreneur, mm -hmm. and former president of Costa Rica, Laura Chinchilla. Please, a round of applause to them. <laughs> Um, without further ado, let's jump into the first question, and that question goes to both of you. Of course, every woman deserves the opportunity to achieve their ambitions and uh, realize their full potential. What actions can be taken by all to foster more inclusive spaces for women of all identities to be supported and empowered, and whether this be, this be in our workplace or in our own communities? Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, we need to use this. Um, can you hear me? Yes, is it yes, working? Perfect. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with, uh, with you. Um, we have been together in many things today. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, thank you very much, all of you who are still here. It has been a very long day for all of us. Yes. Um, well, I, I would say that. Um, you know, when, when you analyze what is happening in politics, in the marketplace, um, probably we will find different kind of obstacles, um, more specifics in one area than in other. But in general, I would like to mention two or three that cross over uh, all the sectors. And that has to do uh, first, uh, and that is a very, very important obstacle uh, to women's aspiration, and that has to do with the unpaid work. Yeah. Um, that is the main obstacle. In fact, when I was president, uh, one of my main policies was to provide the families with um, care programs financed by uh, the public sector, the state, the government. So basically, uh, what we did was to facilitate many women who wanted to enter into politics or continue studying or, uh, you know, uh, having a job or trying to uh, pursue a kind of entrepreneurship, uh, we provided them this kind of alternative, uh, a program for early childhood care or for the, those elder members of the family. And that made a difference in many of women, in many of single families that we had in our country. Uh, the other uh, important obstacle is usually access to finance. Either if you are in politics, it is very hard for women to try to get uh, the money to finance the campaign. So usually what is important is to try uh, to have a minimum of financing um, secure by public financing for campaigns, for example, as it is the case in many countries uh, in the world. Uh, but also, when you are going to the uh, to the um, to the marketplace, also access to finance is critical for uh, many uh, uh, entrepreneurs, female entrepreneurs. And, and finally, um, something that for me is the main, main, main obstacles that we will continue facing for the years to come, uh, because the situation is even worse today than it was before, and that is the, um, you know, those, uh, those uh, social norms that impact on us. It's the perception of the people still biased, according to the Global um, Values Survey, uh, the last one, uh, we still have many people uh, who thinks that men can perform better than women, both in politics and in the economy. And that is just the perception, because according to other kind of indicators, there are no differences, and in some occasions, we are more competitive than men. So I would say that probably social norms is the main obstacle we should continue uh, working on, and I can say a little bit more about that later on. Thank you so much. Yeah. Let's move to Iftihash. Uh, 
Would you like to share some of the reflections from your side about that question? Of course. Um, first of all, thank you so much, uh, One Young World, for having me. Um, I've done quite a few events, but this is my first, I guess, where I'm actually speaking. And I've had so much fun uh, with Laura. It's been such an honor uh, to spend so much time with you. And I love that you, uh, the note that you ended on. And I feel like it's, um, we talked about this earlier, how in both of our careers, it's been really difficult to be the first. And um, as an athlete, I feel like for a lot of people, they see, you know, maybe an athlete on the Olympic podium, or you see them like winning the US Open or winning, you know, a world championship or that sort of thing. But what people don't see is like the underside of sport, the underbelly and, and the difficulties of, of being first and kind of facing a lot of adversity and challenges in order to make it. And um, one thing that I feel like has really driven me, especially in my time after sport and after the Olympics is like, how do I drive change? How do I you know, make an impact? And I feel like so much of that is really investing in women, investing in our girls and making whatever it is that you do um, a service to others. That is a tenet of my faith, you know, is to use my time on this earth wisely and use it as a way uh, to be an agent of change. And I think that just having the opportunity to encourage our girls and make and create space for them, but also, as Laura said, really changing the minds, not just outside of our home, but inside of our homes and our hearts as well. We have to uplift and encourage and let our girls know that they're capable, that they're, that they're just as strong as men, if not stronger. And we've heard this time and time again throughout um, the conference is that we as women are half of the world and we create so much and so often and we provide so many good things so we have to continue to push that agenda and hopefully encourage our girls to know and understand their worth absolutely thank you so much and uh, to continue this uh, conversation how has your persistence as a female Muslim athlete translated into your work as an activist? Yeah. Well, um, for those of you who don't know, I was the first Muslim uh, woman to represent the United States at the Olympic Games, and also the first, uh, thank you. <laughs> and I did that in the sport of fencing. If you guys know anything about fencing, it's like a predominantly uh, white sport. Um, it's always been reserved for the wealthy and the elite, so you don't find a lot of people with brown skin. You definitely don't find a lot of hijabs. And so um, essentially throughout my journey, it's been met with a lot of ridicule and a lot of challenges, even on the professional level. Um, I was met with a lot of resistance. People want to keep the sport the way that it is. They don't want to see change. And uh, even we see someone like Serena in her retirement still face a lot of um, pushback in her greatness and like who she is because um, a lot to do with you know her ethnicity and so um, I knew immediately that my journey was bigger than me as an athlete and even after the Olympics I wanted to help Muslim girls around the world understand that um, they have a place in sport but I also knew that I was now a lens like kind of into, into our community as Muslims. I want people to know that not all Muslim women are Arab. You know, we're not oppressed. There's no one forcing us to, to wear hijab. It's a choice that we make and that we can be athletes too. We can also win Olympic medals. Like there's so many cool things about us and there's so many facets and I just want to encourage and also implore people to understand more about the Muslim community because there are so many of us and really push back against uh, the, really push back against the things that we see and we think of as normal. To see Muslims painted as terrorists you know, on television is not normal. Like we've accepted it as the norm, but we really need to push and challenge ourselves to think of people outside of these misconceptions and stereotypes that society has built. So uh, to cut this short, um, what I'm doing now post-career, uh, so many things. I own a clothing company um, that uh, is modest fashion driven. We don't, there are a lot of people who dress modestly in the world, but we're not always served in the fashion industry. So I've been able to do that. And I'm also a children's book author. Uh, my 
children's book is around two sisters who wear hijab. They're named after my two younger sisters, and it's been uh, wildly popular uh, around the globe, and it's really exciting to have my next children's book come out in January. <laughs> Thank you so much, so inspirational. Um, and to continue our conversation about women leadership, because the session is also about female future leadership, just 10 countries globally have a female head of state, and only 13 countries have a female head of government. So what are, the, what are some of the factors driving this imbalance, gender imbalance in governmental leadership, and how can we alleviate these barriers to guarantee equal access those who want to pursue the governmental career? Yeah, uh, it, is, it, is, it is very sad, it is very sad to recognize that instead of, um, of uh, uh, having more women in leadership positions in politics, we are having less women than in the past. Um, I was part of a um, global report on inequalities and of course one of the most significant inequalities has to do with the gender inequalities. And according to our report that was published by the United Nations, um, according to our report, uh, progress uh, in favor of female rights uh, is, uh, is, is basically uh, getting more and more slow uh, in the last years. And that, that, is, that is something that should call our attention because something is happening, there is a kind of backlash against what we were able to do in past decades. So this is a time where we have to uh, act collectively uh, and to be aware about what is happening. For example, when I was president between 2010 and 2014, we were around 15 women uh, as head of state for, from all around the world. Uh, now, we only have about 10. I think that is the figure that you yeah. use. Um, and we are having more than 190 uh, governments mm. uh, in Earth. So we don't have even it's about 5% of governments are being headed by women. That is why we are having this disaster of war now, right now. I mean, yes, yes. I mean, look, look, look at every place. You are having, you know, more violence, wars, that we thought they had been, you know, something of the past. Uh, and when you analyze, for example, the way the different kind of leaderships deal with the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the best cases, those successful uh, cases, were associated with female leadership. And so it means that in general terms, we did as good or sometimes even better than men, but people are electing men instead of female. So that is something that should call, uh, once again, our attention. And according to what I know, uh, it has basically to do with this kind of balladge that we are suffering. That it has to do with a growing perception coming from the population. And that is bad news because the kind of job we have to do is really hard to try to, you know, to change this trend. Uh, the perception of the people uh, during this time of crisis uh, makes them to look for this kind of strong figures which, is, which are associated with the kind of male leadership. So I think that it has to do basically with, uh, once again, social norm, uh, the prejudices and the bias against uh, female leadership. There, so there is much to do in the coming years. Absolutely. Also to recall this like recent incident about Finnish uh, prime minister, right? I think there is like higher criticism for uh, for female leaders. They're really under under the loop and everyone is observing one step uh, outside of the norm so called and of right. course they are judged even more than uh, male uh, leaders. 
Uh, to wrap up this um, session, um, I would like to ask both of you, what would be your three suggestions for young girls who want to become leaders, political leaders? What would be the main advices that you would like to give? Um, well, um, the first thing is that uh, you have to believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. um, that is probably the first step that we female has to take. Because when we speak about uh, social norms, that means that social norms are not only affected the perception of others about us, but it is also affecting us from inside. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you find many women which, has, uh, which have the right condition to lead, but they don't believe in themselves. And you won't be able to lead if you won't believe in, in yourself. Uh, because you need to inspire, you need others to follow you. So that's the first step. And secondly, you just hide once again. I mean, you just have to rely on your capacity. Um, never doubt about your capacity. Um, you know, we have learned that, for example, you are the most, the better prepared generation in history. And I am speaking about female because we are leading in every single terms on the educational field. So you are already prepared to lead and you are already to achieve whatever kind of dream you have. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you. I love that. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with belief first. I feel like it has to precede everything. My mom has told me, my sisters, and my brother, I don't know if, how much you listen, but um, from a really young age, that you have to learn to be a cheerleader for yourself. Like to look in the mirror and support yourself and love yourself and say that I can do this. You're literally speaking those words to power. And it may sound really cheesy, but I feel like that helped me climb the ladder of success as an athlete because no one was going to believe in me unless I believed in myself first. And also um, understanding that you have access. You don't wait for permission from anyone. And that's something that you have to learn really quickly as a person of color in the United States because we're expected to do twice as much with like less than everyone else. So you kind of have to take things. You have to literally pull up a chair, have a seat at the table. Don't wait for permission from other people to be great. Earlier um, today, we heard from a lot of young delegates and a really common theme that I feel like I felt through all of them is just really understanding their power and that they have, that their time is now. A lot of what we hear when it comes to youth is like, you are the future. And it's, no, you're not the future. I feel like you guys are the present and you have to understand your strength, your intelligence, your beauty, and that the world needs you. We need change. And I feel like the change starts with you. Thank you so much. Uh, and this brings to a conclusion of this session. Thank you so much for all the inspiration. And uh, thank you everyone for attending. We know it's quite late. <laughs> we are all tired, but thanks for being here on behalf of One Young World. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Would you like to? Would you like to still say something? Or? Yes. Well, no. Uh, I, I, I. Um, you were saying that the world is needed uh, the female leadership, and I'm convinced about that. Uh, look, one of uh, one of the uh, the most uh, concerning problems we are now having, uh, globally speaking, is uh, democratic backsliding, and that has to do with the preservation of human rights, liberty, but also it has to do with women's rights. So that is why it is very critical to empower women mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. uh, democracy is a feminist cause. It's a cause that we have to embrace and to understand that without democracy, we won't be able to go through as women. So it is our time uh, and you know, the, uh, our countries and our society are calling us. Uh, we need more women in power, 
And I am sure that once that we have more women in power, we will have a better world. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much.